But it's always a pleasure to be with you. I have so many very deep and long relationships uh, with a lot of the a lot of the folks who are here. Some of them are relatively new to many of you, but uh, I go back with a lot of folks here a, a lot of years. Um, we're so thankful for the time that Emma got to spend with you. She has grown so much uh, uh, even since then, and, and we're appreciative of the good influences and the care that, that you gave to her uh, when she was here. I uh, have so many people down at Peachtree City who said, tell all our good brothers and sisters at uh, Buford how, how much that we want them to know we're thinking of them. So um, it, is, it is wonderful to see you and to be here uh, with you tonight. Um, I am going to suggest that you move the church building a little closer to Peachtree City. It took me about two hours and 45 minutes to get here uh, today. Uh, I, can get to, I can get to Alabama in about half the time it takes me to get to Buford. So it really, it, it's hard to believe that I, we're just on the other side of the, we're just on the other side of the city. And, and I know that may be a, be a simplification there, but uh, we're, we're not that far. Uh, but I am glad to be with you. I always appreciate Mike. He's such an encouragement to me in, in a lot of ways and, and has been. I appreciate your good elders. Appreciate everything that this church uh, is doing. Um, I don't appreciate uh, the fact that uh, this morning when I got ready to get my Bible and, and uh, get it out and, and polish up what I wanted to say tonight, uh, that I could not find it. And uh, about 11.45, my wife texted me and she said, uh, your Bible is in the back of my car. Um, she was in LaGrange and, and it was either drive, about, you know, drive down there and get it or, or make do. So I got a Bible out uh, that I haven't preached um, from in quite a while. And uh, I thought, well, that's no problem. I know, I know what I want to say. I know the text that I want to deal with and that sort of thing. And lo and behold, I got the thing out and opened it, and it's a foreign language. Uh, I, I, can't e I can't even read it. Uh, so, so I found these things. They were laying around, and if, I don't know if you can see or not. They're, they're a little... They, they've seen better days, evidently. I, I, they're always hers. I always steal hers because I don't actually own any of these things, um, supposedly. Uh, so so uh, I thought about that tonight. I thought about how interesting it is that we come back to the Bible, right? Every, every time we open the Bible, you know, you know there, there is something about the Bible that, that you can count on. You can bet on. Every single time you open the Bible, it's going to be the same. It's going to be the same every, every single time. It's not going to have changed from the last time that you opened it and looked at it, right? So, so here's what this tells me when I opened this thing and I couldn't read it today. It tells me that even though I have changed, the Bible has not. And I think that that is a great comfort to us. But I also think it's something that, that we need to not only accept but also be encouraged by. That you're never going to run dry in this well right here. There's, there's never going to come a time when this, doesn't, when this doesn't satisfy you or challenge you or convict you because even though it doesn't change, we do. And so we come to these stories over and over again. We come to these, these passages of Scripture that, that are familiar to us, and yet every time we come to these familiar passages of Scripture, we have changed, so we're dealing with new territory as we approach the Scripture. And it's one of the wonderful things about Scripture. I don't know if you've ever done, uh, taken, taken that, uh, every now and then people will be playing games, and they'll, they'll say something like this. List, list the five books that if you were stranded on a desert island, that you, would take, that you would take with you. And I think most of us, obviously, would, you know, I don't know what your other four would be, but most of us, I think, every time would say, you know, we want to take the Bible with us. But I think what we fail to realize is the idea that the Bible is so inexhaustible because of what it does to us. Because it changes us and forms us. And, and like I said, every time we go back to it, even though it, has, even though it hasn't changed, uh, we, we have. Tonight we're going to look at a story that, that most of you have, have looked at probably a number of times. We're going to start in, in probably one of the most famous passages of all of the Bible. Uh, chances are when you were growing up, there were three m verses that you uh, memorized very early on. The first one is John eleven thirty five. 35, right? All right. Jesus wept. 
You know, when you were at camp, you know when you were at church camp, they said, okay, we're going to have a contest to see who can memorize the most Bible verses. Your hand shot up. John 11.35, Jesus wept. Uh, but probably after you learned uh, John 11.35, you probably uh, learned John 3.16. Can't go to, can't go to a, hardly a, a sporting event where somebody's not holding up a sign. And I guess they used to do it more than they, than they do now. But John, you know, John 3.16, for God so loved the world. Maybe you uh, learned Psalm 23, probably did, but, but most of us in here can quote John 3.16. And yet the context of John 3.16 is in our introduction to one of the most interesting disciples of Jesus. And, and um, we, we probably should, should be careful what we say about Nicodemus as far as describing him as a disciple of Jesus. I think what we're going to see is, is something that is a little, little different in regard to Nicodemus' story. And that is, most of the time, when, when we see Jesus approach somebody, for instance, when he approaches uh, Peter and Andrew and James and John, and he says, come after me and I will make you fishers of men, what do they do? They drop their nets and follow him, right? Jesus is, uh, and Matthew is sitting at the tax table, and Jesus comes along and says, Matthew, follow me. Matthew gets up from what he's doing, follows Jesus. On the day of Pentecost, those 3,000 people there heard the gospel, and they responded to the gospel, and they said, what should we do? And Peter said, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And what they do? They got up and they did it. So that is our usual, that's the usual model that we see in Scripture. The Ethiopian eunuch, he's driving down the, driving down the road, and, and Philip jumps up in there. They study Scripture for a while, and the eunuch says, See, here's water. What hinders me from being baptized? And Philip, of course, tells him, If you believe, then, then you can. And they go out and they, they baptize him. So, so generally speaking, our responses to Jesus and the gospel are often immediate. But what John shows us about Nicodemus is that many times faith in Jesus is a process. That commitment to Jesus is, is a process. And that's why I'm thankful for so many of the characters in the Gospel of John because we get a, a different viewpoint from John than we get from the other, from the other Gospels. Um, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, as you know, are sometimes called the synoptic gospels, S-Y-N-O-P-T-I-C. Synoptic means to look at the same thing the same way, okay? Synoptic. John is kind of a, kind of a rogue. John, John, is, John is showing us different people in different ways. He introduces us to people that the other gospel writers uh, don't mention to us, the woman at the well that we have already mentioned. Um, Nicodemus, uh, we, we learn about exclusively in John. We, we get to learn a great deal about the character of Thomas in John. We, we get a different angle on Martha in John. And so I'm thankful that we have tonight to study not just one passage of Scripture about Nicodemus, but, but three. Did you, did you know that Nicodemus is mentioned in John three times? Probably you did. I'm probably not throwing anything that's a surprise to you out there. But, but when we look at these three passages, what we see Nicodemus doing is getting closer and closer and closer to Jesus. We see him taking steps of commitment throughout the course of Jesus' life. And it is a fascinating journey, and I'm looking forward to, to taking it with you uh, tonight. In John chapter 1, uh, we see Jesus coming to uh, John the Baptist. We see um, certainly Jesus' growing ministry, his, his growing popularity. Um, John's, John's ministry, uh, a baptizing ministry, had already uh, caught the attention of the Pharisees. Nicodemus is a Pharisee. He's one of these men who is, who is very high up. Um, historical... Uh, records of the day or historical records that talked about this, this day suggested to us that Nicodemus was the third wealthiest man in Jerusalem at the time. Now that is, that is fairly interesting, isn't it? And I think the text kind of bears out that he was certainly a man of means. When we get to our last passage about him, we're going to see this. But, but being on the Sanhedrin meant that he was not only 
likely very, very wealthy, but he was also very, very, very powerful. It also meant that he was likely a, a Pharisee, and as you remember, Pharisees had a great, it's hard to say love for the law, but they were very, very strict in regard to their observance of the law. You know, our general uh, thinking about Pharisees is that all of them were hypocrites. Uh, that all of them, in insisting on the, the tiniest little matters of the law and neglecting other things that, that were important, they all must have been hypocrites. But don't you think it's, it's very likely that some of those Pharisees actually loved the law of Moses? That they actually were tithing on their mint and anise and cumin because they believed that that's what God wanted them to do? I think what we're going to see in Nicodemus is a a fair-minded Pharisee instead of a, a hypocritical one. Jesus has drawn the attention of the Pharisees by, by continuing uh, the ministry that John had started, this baptismal ministry, but he had also done something else that really got their blood up. And that is that he had uh, cleansed the temple of uh, all those who were changing money there and buying and selling there. What Luke suggests to us was not just that this was a shot at the Pharisees' authority, but this was also a shot at the Pharisees' pocketbook. We're told that the Pharisees loved, loved money, and many of them were very, very wealthy, as we've, we've already mentioned. So when we get to chapter 3, and we read this, and, and really we, we ought to back ourselves up just a little bit to the end of chapter 2, um, Look at verse 23 of chapter 2. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast. Now, one of the things that John does for us is John divides Jesus' ministry for us into three Passovers. This is the first of three Passovers that John mentions. Almost half of the book of John, from chapter 11 to the end of the book, takes place after that third Passover. Okay, so we think of the three years of Jesus' ministry. John marks them with the Passover. This is the first time... John sets that date for us. This is the first of three in, in the Gospel of John. Uh, so he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast. Many believed in his name when they saw the signs which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all men. And he had no need that anyone should testify of men, for he knew what was in man. Now imagine for a second that there aren't any verse divisions. Imagine for a second that there aren't any chapter divisions. And you've just read that Jesus did not need to get a report on anybody. Because He knew what was in everybody. He knew everybody. And so when we start chapter 3, and again imagine there's no break there. Uh, he had no need that anyone should testify of man, for He knew what was in man there was a certain man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus. I, th I think sometimes that, that chapter division hurts us just a little bit because, because what we're being told here is that Jesus knew the thoughts, the intents. He knew the heart of the people who were coming to Him. Sometimes He'll look at them and say, You hypocrites. Sometimes He will castigate them and rebuke them. But that's not the case here with Nicodemus. And why? Because he knew what was in man. He knew that this was a sincere seeker. He knew it was somebody who was looking for the answers. He knew it was somebody who loved the law, not as a, not as a way of establishing his own righteousness, but as a way of reflecting the righteousness of God. And so when we read uh, in verse 2 that this man came to Jesus by night. This man came to Jesus by by night. I want to suggest to you, first of all, and we're going to, again, as we look at these three passages, I'm going to make three points about each, uh, one, one point about each of the three passages. The first point being that commitment is a learning process. Commitment is a learning process. Coming to Jesus is a learning process. Okay? This man came to Jesus by night. You know, there are a few times in Scripture where we'll read something like that. And uh, we will be very judgmental, okay? For instance, when Jesus says to Martha, 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 you are worried and troubled about many things. You know, that's generally the way we think of Martha, right? 
Well, there's a whole lot more to Martha than that, and John chapter 11 proves that. Uh, when I say, for instance, the name Thomas, what's, what, what immediately comes to your mind? Doubting Thomas, right? If you look, did you know that if you look up Doubting Thomas in the dictionary, it will say a habitually doubting person? He's literally, he's literally the dictionary definition of somebody who doubts habitually. Did you know that Thomas is the one who, who occasioned that great discussion about Jesus being the way in John chapter 14? Did you know that when, when Jesus was going back to uh, Judea for the last part of his life, it's Thomas who says, let us go with him so that we can die with him. You know, we, we don't generally think about those things, right? And Nicodemus, as, as we see him progress through his relationship with Jesus, we read this, he came to Jesus by night. And what do we think about that? Well, he's ashamed. He's, he's embarrassed. Um, and no doubt, he's, he's hiding. And, and there, there's an element of that to it. But he also wants to know. He also, he also comes out of that darkness to ask Jesus some questions. To find out who Jesus is. To see what kind of authority he really has. To see what kind of insight he really has. You know, most of these Pharisees would have been expecting the arrival of a Messiah. They've sent folks out to John to ask if John was the Christ, right? Are you the Christ? Are you Elijah? Are you one of the prophets? Who are you? And this sincere searcher wants to know who Jesus is. Before we are too hard on Nicodemus by thinking that he came to Jesus out of the dark, we need to remember that all of us come to Jesus out of the dark. You might say, Stan, what do you mean by that? Well, here's what I mean by that. All of us come to Jesus out of the darkness of sin. All of us come to Jesus out of the darkness of guilt. All of us come to Jesus out of the darkness of ignorance. And so when you see this man coming to Jesus, when you see him looking around and, and knocking on the door and, and wanting to come in and speak to the Savior, let's not judge him because he's coming out of the darkness. Because we all come to the Savior out of darkness. It might not be the literal darkness of night, but it certainly is spiritual darkness to which we come to ask how we can be citizens of the kingdom of heaven. So here's Nicodemus here, and he says, uh, This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Now let me tell you as this begins that these confessions are very, very powerful confessions. Okay? For Nicodemus to call Jesus Rabbi, would have been a radical, a radical statement. It would have been a statement of humility. It would have been a statement acknowledging that Jesus had something to teach him. It's very, very strange that a man who is on the Sanhedrin, one of the wealthiest, most influential Pharisees in all of Jerusalem, would humbly call Jesus rabbi. And yet he does. And of course, I think the reasons that he does that are here. Uh, he, he says, we know that you are a teacher come from God. Who's the we there? Do you ever wonder about that? We know that you are a teacher come from God. A little bit later, the rest of the Sanhedrin is going to say something like this. Have any of the rulers of the Jews believed Jesus? And of course, at that point, Nicodemus is still too afraid to raise his hand. But who's, who's the we here? Is it all of the people that are following Jesus? Is it, is it the, the folks who is healing? Who is the we here? Whoever it is, Nicodemus includes himself in that group. We know that you are a teacher come from God. You see, authority was important to Nicodemus. Authority was important to Nicodemus. And he acknowledges the authority of Jesus. We know you're a teacher from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. What was the proof? How do we know that you are a teacher come from God? Well, Nicodemus says, because we're seeing what you do, and nobody could do these things unless God was with them. You know, proof is, is pretty important in John. 
There's a reason for that. Proof is very important in the Gospel of John. And the reason for that is, is because of why John was written. You know, if you look at the book of Matthew, it's written to a Jewish audience. You have the Jewish genealogies. You have, here's what the kingdom of heaven is going to look like. The word kingdom is used all, all the way through. Matthew is a Jewish book through and through. Mark, on the other hand, is a Roman book through and through. It is about power. It is about authority. It is about, it is, you know, very quick, very short. We don't see baby Jesus lying in a manger. We don't have any genealogy or anything like that. We see Jesus commanding, and we see his power. Luke's a very, Luke is a very Greek gospel. You have these long, flowery stories. You have, you have a, a well, well-crafted narrative. But John is, is different from those three. We've already mentioned that. John was written to uh, address a false teaching that began circulating in the uh, late decades of the uh, first century. It was a false teaching that was called Gnosticism. Interestingly, uh, the word Gnosis, the Greek word Gnosis, means know or knowledge. And these Gnostics claimed to have this, this, uh, this hidden knowledge. Okay. Paul in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6 will be writing to Timothy and he urges him to refuse uh, profane babblings which are falsely called knowledge. You remember that? Um, when you get to the book of 1 John, if you ever go to the book of 1 John, um, look and underline, go through 1 John and just underline the word no every time in 1 John. John and 1 John both. I think John uses the word no 84 times. Knowing is important to John. Okay? Knowing is important to John's audience. So there's this great emphasis placed on knowing in John. So when we get to the end of it and we see Thomas asking for proof, that is consistent with John all the way through. Um, at one point, Jesus will say something like this to those who are there. Hey, if you don't believe the words that are coming out of my mouth, here is the proof. You can look at the Scriptures. You can look at, you can look at uh, the works that I am doing. You can look at the witness of the Spirit. And, and John will give us uh, four things that Jesus says you can look at and you can know. So when Nicodemus says here in, in verse 3, um, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Very consistent with the purpose of the whole Gospel of John. Here's the proof. You can know it. Okay? Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly I say to you, unless he is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Well, Jesus has a tendency to, to cut through the flattery, right? And I don't, think, I don't think Nicodemus is flattering here. I think, he's being, I think he's being humble. I think he is being sincere. But Jesus wants to get to the heart of the matter pretty quick, okay? And he says this, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, this was a radical statement. And it is a statement that would have shaken Nicodemus to his core. Here's why. Of anybody living in Jerusalem at the time, the last person who would, be, who would want to be born again would be Nicodemus. I mean, if you're born again, every, almost everything that he had, his, his position, his wealth, everything that he had was a consequence, or we might say an accident, of his of his birth. I mean, you're telling a man who is, who is a, a Pharisee who can track his lineage back at least as far as, as the, the return to Jerusalem. And, and probably, he could probably, Nicodemus could probably track his genealogy at least to Abraham. And you're telling Nicodemus that he's got to be born again. Man, if he's born again, he, he, he might be a Samaritan. If he's born again... He might be a Gentile if he's born again. He might be a woman if he's, if he's born again. He might be poor if he's born again. And so, you know, we're familiar with this born again phrase, and we understand that it is a, it is a, it is a religious and a spiritually loaded phrase, right? Uh, probably more religiously loaded uh, than, it, than it needs to be. A lot of people use it completely wrong and you know, use it for an adjective and all this kind of stuff. But, but to Nicodemus, this is absolutely novel, and it's absolutely horrifying. I don't want to be born again. 
Everything I have is because I was born who I am, where I am, the way I am. He doesn't want to be born again. And so because of that, because of the, the, the terrifying nature of that statement, I think probably we can, we can understand why he kind of laughs that off, right? And that's what he does here. He, he's not, he's not uh, by any stretch of the imagination, I think, suggesting that he actually believes that a man can enter his mother's womb and be born again. I don't think he believes that for a second. I think that this is his, his, his idea of kind of laughing off something that he's terrified of. And honestly, the idea of, of being born again really probably should be more terrifying to us than it is. Because what Jesus is asking for is a complete change of who we are. Asking us to completely, in a sense, give up ourselves. And this won't be the only way that he'll say it. He'll say things like, if anyone would follow me, let him take up his cross daily and follow me. He'll say things like, let him die with me. Paul will even go so far as to say, the life that you see in me is not my life. It is, it is Jesus' life. And I know that, that we talk about baptism, and, and, and I think this passage does suggest that to us, does introduce us to that concept. But how deeply do we believe that becoming a Christian radically and essentially changes or should change who we are? And I know we, we, we laugh when, when Nicodemus says, Oh, can a man be born again? Because here's what Nicodemus is doing. Nicodemus is acknowledging... The, the radicality of Jesus' statement that we have to be born again to be His disciples. That we do have to be changed. That we do have to take upon ourselves a new identity. And, and we don't like that because a lot of times we're very comfortable with the identity we've got. We're very comfortable with the, the habits we've got, our place in the world. Our, you know, we're comfortable with those things. Jesus did not come to make us comfortable with who we are. Jesus didn't come to pat Nicodemus on the back and say, Nicodemus, you're doing great, just keep up the good work. No, you've got to be changed. You've got to be altered. Your, your, your essence has to be radically changed before you can be my disciple. And so Nicodemus, of course, uh, laughs that off. Uh, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his, his mother's womb and be born? Jesus said, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. Now, let me, let me just uh, indulge me in just a few minutes of, of making a connection that I suggested to you during our, during our devotional a few minutes ago. And that is the connection between the Spirit and and water, particularly in John's writings. Okay? Uh, but I think as, as we get into uh, even Acts chapter 2, where, where baptism is, is commanded, and generally as we read John chapter 3 here, and we read born of water and the Spirit, we, we automatically jump to Acts chapter 2, 38, right? Repent, let everyone be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for remission of sin, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So there's a connection in that, in that plan of salvation between water and the Spirit. But Jesus very carefully describes that relationship particularly in, in the Gospel of John. Okay? So flip over real quick to chapter 4. And here's the woman at the well, of course. And uh, here's what he says to her. He says in, in verse 13, Whoever drinks of this water um, will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. And of course, she wants that water. Why does she want it? Well, because she didn't want to come out here in the heat of the day and draw water anymore. No, she didn't want to do that. So she's, she's searching for something, and he's offering her something else. Now flip over real quick to John chapter 7. We might as well stay in John chapter 7. We'll leave, we'll leave the, the John chapter 3 Nicodemus uh, for a minute. Um, but while we're in chapter 7, even, even before we get to Nicodemus, I want you to see what verse 37 of this chapter says. 
On the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirst, let him come to me and drink. Now that sounds pretty familiar, doesn't it? Doesn't that sound like John chapter 4? John chapter 4, he'd offered this woman water. She didn't know what he was talking about. She said, yeah, I want it. He said, well, I can give it to you. It'll bring you everlasting life. Look at what he says in verse 38. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow living waters. Living waters. Now watch what verse 39 says. Verse 39 is John's comment on what Jesus said in verse 38. Holy Spirit inspired comment. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit whom those believing in Him would receive, for the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. So John explains to us what the living water is. He explains to us what it is that's going to well up in us and and give us everlasting life. And he says it's it's the Holy Spirit. Now if you follow... John's writings, and, and just leave your finger right there in John chapter 7. But go, if you've, got, if you've got the dexterity to get over to 1 John chapter 5 at the same time, flip over to 1 John chapter 5 and look at starting in verse 4. Okay? And again, the description and relationship and importance of the Spirit, even in John chapter 4. Remember John chapter 4? Uh, Jesus goes into talking about worship, and, and uh, God is a Spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in Spirit and truth. Here's here's 1 John 5, verse 4. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. uh, Who is he who overcomes the world, but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? This is he who came by water and the blood. Now remember when Jesus was pierced on the cross, we're going to see what come out, blood and water. Why that's interesting is every time that we are introduced to Nicodemus, we have this connection between blood and water and the Spirit every time. Because here's our three, here's our three Nicodemus passages. John 3, John 7, which we just read, where we're told that that water is the Spirit. And then John chapter 19, where, Jesus and Joseph, where Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea take Jesus' body and put it in the tomb. Okay? Same, same chapter. Okay? So each time we see the Spirit and blood and water connected in, in Nicodemus' story as it relates to Jesus. It's just, and and I, I'm, too, uh, I'm too much a believer in, in providence to think that that's coincidence. Now, I'm not sure exactly what the significance is, but every time Nicodemus shows up, there is this discussion about water and the Spirit, blood and water. And, and you see that every time Nicodemus comes into the picture. So we're still reading here in 1 John. Um, 1 John chapter 5, verse 6. Um, This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not only by water, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit who bears witness, because the Spirit is truth. For there are three who bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. And there are three that bear witness on earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three agree as one. If anything, God is wanting us to take a pretty careful look at what it means to be born of water in the Spirit and shows us every time Nicodemus shows up, y'all need to think about this. And that's, and that's what he does. So here we are back in John chapter 7. Go back there if you don't mind. And let's look at the second time we, we meet Nicodemus. Um, we'll start, this is, this is a meeting that is going on about Jesus. Um, we've already read 37, 38, and 39. Verse 40 says this, Therefore many from the crowd, when they heard this, saying, said, Truly, this is the prophet. Others said, this is the Christ. But some said, will the Christ come out of Galilee? Has not the scripture said that Christ comes from the seed of David and from the town of Bethlehem where David was? I love the fact that that we're going back here and we're establishing things that we know about Jesus but the the other folks didn't know. And so we're reading this. And remember, John is writing... From a, from a standpoint that's chronologically removed from these initial events. And he's saying, here's what folks were saying, and you know that he was born in Bethlehem. You know that he came from the line of David. And so when you get to this point at the end of, of the Gospel of John, when, when John is, is talking about what Jesus says to Thomas, and he tells Thomas, blessed are you who have, you know, you who have seen and believed, but blessed are those who have not seen. And they still believe. 
They still believe because of this report. They still believe because of these words, because of this, this eyewitness testimony that is being offered here that they can know. And John will say that at the end. I, I'm writing you these things so that you can know that you have eternal life. Uh, others said this is the Christ. Some said, well, Christ come out of the Galilee. Is not the scripture said that Christ comes from the seed of David and from the town of Bethlehem where David was? So there was a division among the people because of him. Everybody's discussing it. It's no secret. There's, there's no, uh, there's no uh, mystery here. Everybody sees it. They've seen it, and, and they're talking about, who is this? And it can't be the Christ, right? Because he's, he's from Galilee, and Christ comes from Bethlehem. See, we know that now, but they, they didn't know that. Okay. Um, now, some of them wanted to take him, but no one laid hands on him. Now, what that particular phrase means, we're not sure, because sometimes when that phrase is used, we're told that they wanted to take him and anoint him and make him king, right? Other times we're told that they wanted to take him and, and stone him, okay? So we don't know exactly what that phrase means, particularly in this, in this passage. Then the officers came to the chief priests and the Pharisees who said to him, Why have you not brought him? I, I like this story. We're only catching the back end of it. The, the first part of this story is the Pharisees send some guys to drag Jesus to them to answer their questions, to be interrogated by them. So they send these thugs out to do that and bring Jesus back. And when they come back, they're empty-handed. And they say, well, where is he? Why, do, why didn't you bring him back? And here's what, what they said. I love this. No man ever spoke like this man. Then the Pharisees answered, are, are you also deceived? Here's, here's the phrase I mentioned to you a little minute ago. Have any of the rulers of the Pharisees believed in him? Well, there's a couple of rulers who were sitting there in that Sanhedrin who were squirming. One of them is Nicodemus. Um, I think another one is probably Joseph of Arimathea, um, who, who was very likely on the Sanhedrin uh, himself and also very wealthy. Uh, but you don't see these guys... Well, let's just, let's just keep going. Let's, all right. Have any of the other rulers of the Pharisees believed in him? But this crowd that does not know the law is accursed. The Pharisees just didn't look down on certain groups of people. The Pharisees pretty much looked down on everybody. Everybody. This crowd, this, this rabble, they don't even know the law. I mean, here they're talking about the Christ. And we know this guy's from Galilee, and there's, they don't even know the law. Interestingly, we're told this, verse 50. Nicodemus, that is, he who came to Jesus by night, being one of them, that is, the Pharisee on the Sanhedrin, says to them, now watch this, Does our law judge a man before it hears him and knows what he is doing? Now, we're tempted to say, yeah, Nicodemus, you stick up for Jesus. Nicodemus is not sticking up for Jesus. He's sticking up for the thing that every Pharisee is supposed to be sticking up for, which is what? The law. He's supposed to be, all the Pharisees are saying, yeah, they, what they should say is, here, here, good point. That's, that's a point of law, because they're all about law, right? But I think we see here not just the sincerity of Nicodemus, but also the hypocrisy of the Pharisees generally speaking, that as long as the law didn't get in the way of their prophet, as long as the law didn't get in the way of what they really wanted to do, didn't get in the place of their social position, then they were all about the law. But they certainly felt justified, and maybe justified is the wrong word because there's a legal connotation to that. They felt, uh, what should we say, uh, eh, whatever. They, let's just say it real simple like this. When, when it was convenient for them to keep the law, when they wanted to, they did when somebody stands up and says, oh, point of law, then they laugh him down. Which, I think we see this, and as soon as he says this, as soon as he says, does our law judge a man? Perfectly legal argument. Does our law judge a man before it hears him and knows what he's doing? They answered and said to him, are you from Galilee? I don't know what the, what the neighborhood around here is or the, what the little town around here is that you could, that you could say. Um, and people would take offense to it, okay? When I was growing up, it was Mount Pleasant, okay? Mount Pleasant's a great town now, but when we were growing up, if you said, what are you from Mount Pleasant? You know, that that, that was, that, that was a, that was a insult. And when they say, are you from Galilee? It is an insult. It is an insult. Are you from Galilee? 
Search and look, for no prophet has arisen out of Galilee. And everyone went to his own house. And we make our second point uh, from this particular passage, and that is, if, if conversion or commitment is a learning process that chapter 3 suggests to us, then we also learn here that coming to a commitment with Jesus, for Jesus, is also a risky process. That when you, when you raise your hand to speak up for Jesus, you're going to be made fun of. When you raise your hand to speak up for Jesus, you're going to be opposed. That may be as true now as it has ever, ever been. And I know that, that it's easy for us to sit here on Wednesday night and celebrate our mutual faith in, in Christ. And, and we're, not a, we're not ashamed, we're not embarrassed. And our young people, when they go to camp, they're not ashamed and they're not embarrassed. But when we're back at work, it's another thing. When we're in the locker room, it's something else. I read, I don't know, four or five sermons about Nicodemus, just, just seeing if anybody had anything else. And, and one, of the, one of the stories... Uh, that I read today talked about somebody who took their Bible to work, but they had put it in a, a uh, cover of a different book. So nobody would know that they, were, that they were reading their Bible at lunch. You see, if we're going to raise our hand and we're going to say, this is what's right. If we're going to raise our hand and say, this is what's wrong. Then they're going to call us worse things than Galileans. We're going to be opposed by the culture that we live in. You know, these were, these were Nicodemus's peers. You know, Nicodemus had very few peers, but these are his peers, okay? And when he stands up, just to make this, this very slight, very, very legal suggestion in relation to Jesus, he is immediately castigated and ridiculed. Folks, commitment is a risky business. And, and don't think that Jesus didn't tell us that. Here's, here's the thing. You know, we, we have this tendency to think that, that Jesus said, oh, if you become a Christian, here's all the good stuff that you'll happen, and your life will be great from now on. You'll never be tempted again. You'll never have any trouble anymore. I'll just take care of everything. And that's not what Jesus said at all. He said, you want to come after me? Pick up a cross. You want to come to me? Die to yourself. That the... The, the sheer, again, the word radicality of what Jesus is calling us to is to say, if you step out one step to speak for me, the world's going to shout you down. So what do we do? What do we do? Do we, do we not stand up? Do we not raise our hand? Do we not step out? Do we not speak up? But we need to know when we do, we're going to be ridiculed, maybe shouted down. I don't know, I don't know where, where this thing is going. It, it doesn't look good uh, for us as far as, our, as far as our freedoms and our ability to, to say what the Bible says. And we've got to be willing to, to, to at least do what Nicodemus did. Now, now I think we're going to see that Nicodemus goes even a step further than that. And to do that, let's go to chapter 19 of, of John. The last time we're introduced to Nicodemus. Interestingly, while you're turning to John chapter 19, Nicodemus' name means champion of the people. Uh, demos is a, is a word that, that means people or meant people back then. Uh, we get our word democracy from it. Um, so so uh, Nico, interestingly, is, a, is a, it's a, it's kind of a Greek name, which is odd for a member of the Sanhedrin, but we know that they were, they were Greek-speaking Jews in Jerusalem. Actually, most, most of your better educated Jews spoke, spoke Greek. Uh, Nico is our word, you know, our Nike tennis shoes. means what? means victory. Uh, Demos is a name that means, that means people. Okay, so the people's victory or, or champion of the people. And, and I think we see that as a characteristic of him when he says, wait a minute, let's, let's talk about the law for a second. Let's talk, about, let's talk about people's rights. Maybe this was a name that he had earned. He had earned because he stood up for justice, because he stood up for what's right, because he stood with a group of people who were saying they believed in Jesus while you had this other group of people that he was actually a part of who would talk about this rabble who doesn't know the law. So there's, there's something there. It's some, something pretty interesting. All right, so while we're in, in chapter 19, uh, Jesus has, has, uh, has died on the cross. He's died the death of a, 
uh, slave, the death of a, a common criminal. Um, and as he has died there, here's, here's what we read. E- even all of Jesus' family has left. And here, here's a reason for that. Verse 31 of chapter 19. Therefore, because it was the preparation day that the body should not remain on the cross, keep in mind this is the second Sabbath of, of Passover. Passover was an eight-day feast, also called the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It was an eight-day feast. started on one Sabbath, ended on the next. Okay? The second Sabbath was the high Sabbath. So Jesus dies there on that Friday. Before 6 o'clock, every faithful Jew has to be at home gearing up for the high Sabbath. That's why there's this rush to get Jesus off the, off the uh, cross and into a tomb so that you could celebrate the Passover. Uh, interestingly, I, I, hey, I did that here. Remember we talked about the, the, uh, Jesus being our Passover? And that's what, that's what Paul says in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. He is our Passover. Uh, so it's, it's a really neat story, the, the history and the chronology of Jesus' death as it relates to Passover itself. So uh, there's this rush to get Jesus in the tomb. They come to break his legs. Uh, and look at verse 34. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. Remember 1 John chapter 5 we read just a few minutes ago? Every, every, every passage that Nicodemus is mentioned in, there is a mention of water. Okay? Uh, in John chapter 3, must be born of water and the Spirit. John chapter 7, this water uh, he spoke of was concerning the Spirit. Here, when Jesus' side is pierced, blood and water came out. John's going to write about that in 1 John chapter 5. So every mention of Nicodemus is accompanied with the word water in some way, which is fascinating. I don't know that I've ever thought about that before tonight. Um, so, uh, he who has seen and testified his testimony is true, that he knows that he is telling the truth so that you may believe. Now, notice that that follows the statement about what came out of his side. He who has seen has testified and his testimony is true. That's John talking about himself. And so when he writes in 1 John chapter 5, he's writing about this. Um, for these things were done, Scripture should be fulfilled, not one of his bones should be broken. And, and another Scripture says, They shall look on him whom they pierced. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, watch this, but secretly, for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took the body of Jesus. Now watch verse 39. And Nicodemus who at first came to Jesus by night. Remember, we're told he came to him by night in chapter 3. We we are given this exact same description of him in chapter 7, Nicodemus, who came to Jesus by night. Now in verse 19, Nicodemus, who came to Jesus by night. How many Nicodemuses are there? You know, his coming to Jesus by night must have been a pretty important thing because every time his name is brought up after that, Nicodemus, who came to Jesus by night. Um, So, Nicodemus, who came to Jesus by night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 100 pounds. Then they took the body of Jesus, they bound it in strips of linen with the spices, as was the custom of the Jews, is to bury. And in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one yet been laid. So there they laid Jesus, because the Jews' preparation day for the tomb was nearby. Now there's a whole lot more to say about this passage of Scripture. There's, we need to really understand why they wrapped it in spices. I'll tell you why they wrapped it in spices. Because nobody could go see the body on the Sabbath. So when Mary uh, shows up to go see Jesus' body on Sunday, it's already been there since Friday, right? Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. They couldn't go on the Sabbath. And if you're going to go to see an unembalmed body on three days after it's been put in the tomb, that's why it's wrapped in 75 pounds of spices. Okay? Uh, but what you also need to know is that 75 pounds of spices was an extravagant gift of an almost unimaginable price. And that's going to bring us to our last point. The first one was that commitment is a learning process. The second one is that commitment is a risky process. And the third is ultimately that commitment is a costly process. It's going to cost you. It's going to cost you to believe in Jesus. It's going to cost you to associate with Him. Now here, Nicodemus is is actually materially and and financially committing to Jesus. But he's asking for so much more than that. Now probably most of us are like Nicodemus in that we come to Jesus out of the dark with questions. 
we're willing to, to stand up from time to time and say, what about this? Even when, even when the world might shout us down or ridicule us. But are we willing to understand that commitment is a costly process as well? And what are we willing to give? The fact is that we ought to compare our gift to Jesus's. He committed everything to us. Are we willing to commit everything to Him? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we're so thankful for our many blessings. We're thankful for this opportunity tonight to come together and study Your Word. Father, we pray that as we have, have seen the man Nicodemus grow closer and closer to Jesus, being willing to speak up for Him, being willing to, to sacrifice for Him, Father, that, that every day as we get to know Jesus a little better, we're willing to stand up more bravely, to speak up uh, more convictedly. Father, and ultimately when it comes time for us to decide what we are willing to commit to the Lord, that we'll, we'll give what is asked of us. Father, and that's everything. It's our heart, our mind, our life, our strength, our soul, and our spirit. Father, so that as we turn everything over to His control, we look forward one day to being with Him, having our sins washed away, and being given that eternal life which He has promised and which only He can give. It's in Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen.